Today, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Professor Joshua Bengio to, to join us. Joshua is one of the world's leading experts in artificial intelligence. Uh, he's a pioneer in deep learning, and specifically in the rebirth of neural networks. Since 1993, he has been a professor at the University of Montreal in Canada, and he is the founder and scientific director of the Mila Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute, which happens to be the world's largest university-based research group in deep learning. In uh, 2018, you know, Joshua had more citations than any other computer scientist in the world, thanks to his you know, many, many high-impact papers. And that was the year he earned the prestigious Kilman Prize. And this prize is given to distinguished Canadian scholars who have shown continuous excellence and made a significant impact in their field. Of course, Joshua is also the recipient of the Turing Award, uh, which he received jointly with Jeff Hinton and Yang LeCun. And the award honors conceptual engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing and, and of modern AI. Joshua is a fellow of both the Royal Society of London and of Canada. And uh, what is also very, very special uh, about Joshua is that he's deeply concerned about the future and the social impact of AI. And over the years, Joshua has actively contributed to the Montreal Declaration for the Responsible Development of Artificial Intelligence. He supports many AI ethics initiatives and guidelines, and he tries to raise awareness on global issues, including the environment, climate change, and diversity and inclusion. Joshua, as many of you know, is no stranger to IBM Research. Uh, we have you know, enjoyed his participation in our annual AI Research Week events, and uh, many of us have been privileged to collaborate with him and his team over the past several years as part of the AI Horizons Network. And his research is inspiring and impactful with contributions spanning technical machine learning solutions and high-level forward-looking proposals about human and machine decision-making. Today, Joshua is going to describe his work on machine learning projects against COVID-19. That's a topic that, as you all know, here in IBM Research, we're also very passionate about. And he's going to highlight several projects that his team has been working on. One, for example, is the use of AI to accelerate the discovery of antiviral drugs. Or another one about extending cell phone-based contact tracing methods to achieve earlier warning signals of the spread of COVID-19 and more. I'd also like to introduce Francesca Rossi, IBM Fellow and IBM's AI ethics global leader. Francesca will be moderating the question and answer period at the end of uh, Joshua's seminar. And please use the Q&A panel on your console to submit any questions that you have throughout today's session. So Joshua, again, welcome. We're really excited to hear about your latest work. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before I start, uh, I want to go back in time, what seems to be an eternity uh, in the um, end of February and beginning of March when we started to realize that something bad was coming to us. Um, and by, uh, you know, one month after that, I think a lot of scientists around the world were struggling, asking themselves the question, what can I do with my expertise um, to help the fight against this pandemic? And um, and so, so so did we at, at Mila and many of our collaborators around the world. And I must say that through uh, all of these months, I've been uh, really thrilled and my heart has been warmed by the enthusiasm of researchers who are ready to let go of the usual um, issues they grapple with uh, uh, regarding their research that have to do with uh, ego, like, you know, who's going to be the first author or the second author or the last author, and, uh, you know, uh, who's going to get the biggest grant or uh, who's going to get more cited or whatever. Um, so these petty competitions that we have with each other, I think, pale in front of the kind of challenges that uh, face humanity. Uh, and right now we're, we're talking about COVID-19, but I'm hoping that that spirit of collaboration between companies, between research centers, between scientists um, is going to be, you know, in some part going to continue after this, uh, this thing goes away. Um, because we have a lot of other global challenges, including climate change, which is the bigger wave, you know, it's not the second wave, it's the super big wave that's coming very slowly, but surely at us. So that was a little intro um, to tell you a little bit about my spirit. 
Now, uh, I'm going to tell you mostly about two projects that I've been involved with um, at Mila. Um, uh, um, as Dario was saying, one, one really regarding new drugs and the other regarding uh, how to use phones to help fight the, uh, uh, the disease. Um, before I do that, let me uh, say a few words about responsibility since, again, uh, Dario nicely introduced me with a concern for, for that issue. It used to be the case not so long ago uh, when I was uh, a grad student and then a professor for many years that I, I didn't really think about the social impact of my work. It, it was just not a question, right? Because first of all, our work was not really used that much outside of university. So we could just live in our ivory tower and not care too much and just focus on our math and our algorithms and uh, our technical questions. But the world is different now. And we really, really, we have to think about the impact of our work. Um, so that means we have a new responsibility. That means we can't just do our research or uh, if we're engineers working on, on products um, uh, without thinking about questions that we're not used to. That means we have to educate ourselves. Like, oh, there's zero formal education in our current uh, universities, especially in computer science, to prepare us for what it means uh, in terms of ethics, in terms of uh, society, in terms of democracy, in terms of privacy, to have uh, machine learning applications in, in the wild. Oh, sorry. Um, and the thing that actually I'm more scared about in the longer run, not in the, not in the next couple of years, is how what we're doing with machine learning is building very powerful tools. And these powerful tools obviously could be used for good, but they could also be misused. Um, and so there is this kind of wisdom race. We have to become collectively and individually wiser in the way that we, we organize our societies, including how we use technology. Um, we, we have, I think, become wiser. I mean, we have some setbacks uh, I won't talk about, uh, but, um, but not fast enough. And technology is, is getting more powerful every year. Uh, at a rate which I think outpaces our current, uh, you know, ability to improve our uh, collective and individual wisdom. That's the thing I'm most afraid of. It's a little bit like if we, if we were to build um, tools that could be used to build super powerful bombs, but we allow children to play with those 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 tools, which can become weapons and can destroy, you know, uh, each other and and potentially the planet. And, and that's why I also care a lot about um, not just thinking about our responsibility in a negative way, but also how we could use our expertise uh, for uh, goals that are not just profit driven, but also are focused on what um, technology can bring uh, that's best for humanity. Uh, so AI for social good or you know whatever name you'd like for this. Um, and uh, the projects I'm going to tell you about basically fit these kinds of things, uh, uh, whether it it's, it's has to do with uh, healthcare, education, the environment, uh, humanitarian applications, and so on. I think th these are good examples. Okay, so now let me talk about COVID-19 antivirals. Um, so there are a lot of research groups around the world who are struggling to find vaccines and to find antivirals. These are different things. The, the, the vaccines are the ultimate weapon, um, but it, they might take a lot of time, or um, maybe we won't even find good vaccines. Think about HIV, right? We haven't found any vaccine for that yet. Um, so um, a shorter term goal is to build uh, uh, treatments and uh, uh, most commonly through new drugs or repurposing existing drugs. So the first thing you can do is um, take one existing drug that was meant for something else and then realize that it could be used uh, against uh, the, the, the virus. And th the good thing is there are not that many existing drugs, a few thousand. And so you can actually use high throughput um, uh, assays to test every single existing drug. So that's good. But um, now if you go uh, from one drug 
uh, maybe we don't find the answer there and doesn't look like we found that. Um, the next thing up, if you want, in terms of complexity and power is two drugs or three drugs. So we can take existing drugs. So we know their toxicity. We know how uh, they could already, you know, what, what harm they could do and, and, and the fact that they don't harm too much. And we're looking for a combination, which together somehow uh, makes a difference. And we already know, for example, with HIV, that actually, whereas where a single drug, no single drug might um, a cure uh, a disease, sometimes two or three together uh, can make a miracle. And so there is uh, a number of projects going in this direction, and, and, and I'm and involved in one of them. And in terms of machine learning, what this involves is um, uh, putting together a kind of knowledge graph of all the information we have about all the existing drugs and how these drugs are related to protein. So typically a drug, uh, these small uh, molecule uh, drugs, they, they target a particular protein uh, in the sense that the uh, drug is going to typically prevent the operation of the protein or potentially highlight, I mean, uh, enhance it, but usually prevent it. Um, and... Um, and so there's a fairly clear relationship between drugs and proteins, but, but then um, those proteins can have um, in, impact on other proteins. And then, you know, the cells are complicated. We don't fully understand them. Um, so there's a, a complicated set of interactions between different proteins. And then if each drug is somehow doing something to one protein and the proteins interact with each other and you want to have multiple drugs, understanding that network of uh, relationships, at least at a statistical level, um, could really help us guess good new combinations of drugs. And of course, in addition, you can collect data. So once you have candidates, and this is going to be the general strategy, right? So you have some sort of machine learning method to propose candidates, and then you're going to test those candidates. Uh, and you can test them first um, in, uh, as, I, as I said, the uh, assays where you can, you can use robots, for example, to test hundreds or potentially even thousands of new drugs or drug combinations and see um, if, they, if they bind to the target protein or how they affect uh, some cells. And so, uh, and once you start doing this, you get data that you can now incorporate into your set of uh, data points for your machine learning, and then you're gonna iterate. Uh, so you're going to use that data to come up with new candidates. The new candidates are gonna be tested by the biologists. And eventually some of those tests might actually be uh, reasonable, and uh, that's just the beginning of a long pipeline of uh, evaluating the drugs, ultimately leading to uh, clinical tests, which which are going to be, of course, slower and, and more expensive. And so there's this whole funnel of selection. And machine learning now is just acting um, at, at, the, at the top of that funnel to select from a, bunch, a, a, a set of candidates that we don't have time to actually test uh, chemically or biologically. The other um, approach beside combining existing drugs is to create new drugs, uh, new molecules. So now the advantage is we're searching in this huge space of something like 10 to the 60 potential drug-like molecules. Um, the problem, of course, um, is that it's difficult to search in this huge set. And so we want to use, first of all, machine learning methods. Uh, first of all, we can use uh, physical modeling methods that are uh, in silico, we can use machine learning methods to approximate these uh, physical models uh, so that we can do, say, 100 times more evaluations and get an approximate evaluation. Um, and then we can use things like reinforcement learning, active learning, and so on, in order to search the space more efficiently. So that's, that's the story I'm going to focus on. Um, yeah, so, so first of all, just to, you get a sense of the, how big uh, the, the, the problem is or the potential advantage because uh, most small molecules have never been even thought by a chemist or, or uh, a human being uh, and much less been evaluated for real. So there's a huge potential of discovering new drugs, whether it's for COVID-19 or for other things. Uh, if we can develop better tools for searching in that space. So, uh, so that's interesting. Uh, the uh, uh, potential for using machine learning in, in pharmacology and, and drug discovery, I think, is just we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg right now. 
Um, and one of the big issues uh, with the current approaches is it takes a lot of time to to discover a, a reasonably interesting candidate or a lead, uh, anywhere from three to 20 years. And that's one of the reasons why uh, typical drug development is so expensive. In the case of COVID-19, it's clear we can't afford to wait that, that long. And so it's really, really worth it to invest in methods that have the potential to reduce that search to something like six months. Now, we're not sure that we're going to be able to do that, but it's a bet that's really worth doing, given that we are so short on time to find a cure. Okay, so there is something really interesting about, uh, from a, now I'm going a bit more technical. Um, there is something really interesting about searching in that space of molecules um, that uh, uh, has to do with the way that we're going to evaluate new candidates. So, um, you know, naively you could think, well, I propose a candidate and then I have some oracle which tells me how good it is. Like, uh, we want to estimate the binding affinity between the, the, the candidate uh, drug and the target protein. Well, if the world was as simple as that, uh, it would be nice. But, but actually, the world is more complicated. If you want to actually get the answer, how good uh, is this uh, uh, binding, you're going to need to do an actual chemical experiment. And that's going to take a lot of time um, compared to what you could do with uh, uh, in silico experiments. And then in silico experiments, there are many things you could do at different trade-offs between precision or fidelity and computational time. So, so, so we enter a really exciting, I think, uh, research area for machine learning, which is how do we trade off computation for the speed of solving a problem? In our case, we're searching for good candidates, right? So um, each time I take a decision, like I'm going to call a particular oracle, and that oracle is not perfect. It's going to be an approximation. So if I use um, FEP calculations, uh, I can have a very good oracle, but it's super expensive. Um, it, it, you know, it might take like hours or something to, to get an answer uh, or minutes, depending on the kind of calculations you do. Um, you could also use a docking calculation, which is much cheaper than FEP but also has less precision. Um, or you could use a neural net, which has been trained to approximate either the docking or the FEP or a combination of both. Now, what happens if you, if you use an oracle that has less precision is that um, uh, you're going to need to look at many more candidates than if you have one that has uh, uh, more precision. So this is what this picture is saying. So uh, if, you, if you just do like random search and you evaluate candidates using different kinds of oracles, the blue would be like the true one, uh, the green is the FEP and the orange is the docking, um, this is what you should expect in terms of how many candidates you have to look at on the x-axis versus how well you're doing. You want to minimize this binding affinity. And you can see that the slope uh, depends on the precision of your oracle. So anyway, this is uh, uh, raising a lot of interesting questions about uh, deciding at any point in time which oracle I should be calling, uh, given the information I have, and how should I organize the search to, to make that slope uh, better. All right. Um, so we, we have developed a, a research program um, called Lambda Zero, which uh, is... Uh, uh, start, whose starting point is is uh, mu zero the, the the reinforcement learning approach that has been uh, developed for uh, computer go and it starts from uh, running about 200 million simulations of um, um, uh, physical docking and then using those as training examples so so it's interesting that because we're using these uh, these simulations to generate data, this data is kind of low quality, right? It's 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 a, a bit uh, low precision, but it's a lot of data. So you might think that uh, when you do uh, drug discovery, you're going to have very little data because the actual number of candidates you can you can evaluate in real with with you know chemists and and, and biology uh, is going to be fairly small. But then you have this huge amount of low precision data. Uh, where the target has, you know, is is not perfect, and and so this is also an interesting challenge. We we have these two kinds of data. In fact, you're going to have a whole spectrum of different types of data with different precision. How can you take advantage of that? And what's interesting is that 
if you use some sort of some sort of reinforcement learning instead of just randomly guessing candidates and testing them, you can actually really uh, improve. So, so not only you can get an advantage by using a more accurate prediction of what would be the success of a particular molecule, but if you if you search in that space using better machine learning methods, in particular here reinforcement learning and active learning methods, you can also for the same amount of computation. Uh, discover molecules that are substantially better in terms of energy. Um, so uh, this shows uh, where we uh, currently are with one of the elements in, in, in this system, which is going to be the uh, approximate reward function for the reinforcement learning, is just a neural net that predicts the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the outcome of the docking. And, uh, and, and, um, and what's interesting is we can get a fairly good approximation. So uh, on, on the uh, x-axis here is the real docking output, and the y-axis is the predicted output from the neural net. Uh, so it, you know it, it tracks the identity, but there's there's uncertainty and noise around. But but then we can do this 100 times faster than physical docking. Um, what we want, of course, is to uh, be able to use these uh, searching methods in order to uh, virtually scan through a, a, uh, a, a space of molecules which is much larger than would ever be possible by enumerating molecules and then evaluating them separately. Um, one of the components that's very important in, in this kind of research is uh, synthesis ability. So it's not enough that the uh, molecule we're looking for binds well to the target. It, it also be something that chemists can actually build at a reasonable price or you know, even is chemically feasible. So there are um, uh, uh, software using all kinds of chemical rules to evaluate the synthesis ability, and you can also use machine learning because these are also too slow to run uh, to you know to get the nice throughput. So you can use neural nets, and here it's graph neural nets to approximate the result of these synthesis ability calculations. And again, you can approximate these things pretty well. So now you have a, like a double objective, which is. Uh, a, uh, the binding affinity and the synthesizability. And then another one which we haven't incorporated but becomes will become important is toxicity, right? So you want a, a molecule that will bind to your uh, favorite target but is not going to bind to everything else and destroy the person at the same time as uh, killing the virus. Um, yeah, the, this is for chemists. It doesn't mean anything to me. Um, oh, let me just say a few words uh, and I'm going to move on to the other project about Active learning. So, so I mentioned that uh, already. Um, we're going to have these iterations where uh, we uh, use machine learning to generate candidates, and then uh, we're going to um, use these candidates to obtain new experimental data, and then that experimental data is going to be added to the training set. And so, there are all kinds of interesting questions here: um, how to iterate these things in an optimal way. So for example, um, one way to think about it, uh, one aspect of it is simply, well, how do I, what are the criteria for selecting which molecules you want to evaluate? Uh, you might think simplistically that simplistic, uh, in a sim simple minded way that it's just the molecules that have the best score in terms of the, 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 the binding, the predicted binding affinity and the predicted toxicity. Um, but you also want to take into account uncertainty. So you want to maybe doing things like Bayesian optimization uh, or other ideas coming from active learning um, in order to also evaluate molecules for which uh, you have a high uncertainty. So then there are many methods to evaluate uncertainty, uh, which one is going to be more appropriate. Um, and then another interesting question is, when you're going to provide these candidates to the biologists? Uh, you don't want to just give them one molecule at a time because if when you're going to do an experiment, they might as well do it with a, hand, a batch of 100 molecules or something like this. And so you really want to provide a batch of candidates. But if all of these, say, 100 candidates are good, but they're all kind of the same under with some small variations, you're not going to gain a lot of information. So you have to think of this whole iterative process of, as trying to acquire information. So in, in you know with that in mind, you want to take into account the sort of mutual information um, that that these different candidates have with can bring together, um, and so there are things like batch ball, for example, which is a method that's been proposed recently to um, 
to to estimate the the the, the uh, information gain from a whole batch and not just from a single candidate. So there's really a lot of interesting machine learning questions that come up. And oh, and the other interesting machine learning question is instead of thinking of each of these uh, filtering steps and prediction steps as independent machine learning problems, really um, the ultimate goal here is to think of the whole process with uh, the chemistry in the loop is one big search problem where we can use machine learning uh, in a way that's optimized with respect to the whole search process, including the, 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 the feedback coming from, from the real world. Okay, um, so, so the work that is going on right now involves a lot of people, I'm not gonna name them all, but um, uh, you know, people from, from Mila, people from many other organizations, and um, it's really exciting to see the, the energy that goes into this research. Um, all right, um, for the le uh, next uh, 15 minutes or so, let me tell you about a completely different project, which uh, has to do with how machine learning could improve contact tracing, as well as um, epidemiological modeling. So let me say a few words about uh, the, uh, the way that the, the virus propagates. So what you see in the figure is the um, uh, viral load um, evolution uh, during the course of the disease. So zero is the day when uh, you have symptoms appearing, and then you're probably gonna have symptoms for, for a number of days that can vary quite a lot. Um, but the interesting thing is in the three days that precede um, having symptoms, you already have a high contagiousness. So the viral load is how many viruses you're shedding. And that means, you know, a high viral load means you're more likely to be contagious to others. Now, what's really um, um, scary here is that you, you, you're, you're contagious for like two or three days before um, you even know that you're contagious, or at least you, you, that you have any clue that you're contagious. So people, when they realize they have symptoms, they get worried, and they will typically change their behavior. Uh, so they will become more prudent, uh, go out less, uh, maybe even go in quarantine. Um, the problem is, uh, well, okay, so one problem is there are people who don't care. That's a social problem, and a political one. Um, but there are also people who simply are not aware that they could be contagious. And if we can bring any kind of information to, um, to these people so they can change their behavior, just be a little bit more prudent, right? Take, take a bit more distance. Um, stay at home if you can, work from home, things like that. Um, uh, then we can really save lives and reduce the, the rate of um, spread of the virus. All right. So how can we do that? Well, um, first of all, uh, let me tell you about one of the most powerful tools we have to uh, provide early warning to people, and that's contact tracing. So uh, that's you know usually done manually. Um, we ask people who have been tested positive to report who they have been in contact in the last couple of weeks. And then we contact those people and we ask them to go in quarantine uh, and potentially be tested. So, um, so that's, that's the standard way, but there are, there are a number of issues with this. Um, the main issue is it's only when the person, you know, uh, has been tested and usually that maybe like a week after they started having symptoms, um, um, that the information can propagate to the people they have been in contact with. But by that time, many of these people uh, may already be, be symptomatic and uh, they already know that they might have the disease. And so it's not going to change as much. Um, if we could know that you are uh, carrying the disease earlier, uh, then we can warn your contacts earlier. So that's, that's a little bit of what we're trying to do here. So, um, so yeah, that's where digital contact tracing comes in. But, well, first of all, one thing I forgot to mention is, uh, at least in, in countries like Canada, it takes a while between a positive test and a contact tracer to actually call all of the people uh, that you know. Uh, we're talking about like between one and two days. So that's an extra delay, and if you consider the little time window that we have that I mentioned of like two to three days, 
adding one or two days to this is really bad. Like we really are playing against the clock. So everything we can do to shave time in uh, the way that information propagates from people who clearly have the disease or might have the disease to people who don't know that they might have it uh, could have a big impact. So, so digital tracing, that means we're trying to do something comparable to uh, contact tracing, manual contact tracing, uh, but we, are, we would like to take advantage of your phones to allow the information to propagate A, faster, and two, um, even to people you don't remember spending time with. Maybe you were, I don't know, in, in a queue or in a bar together, and of course you don't know that person, so you, you can't like remember that person's phone number and, and name and so on, so that the contact tracer can, can find her. So, so that's, that's you know, the, the promise of uh, digital contact tracing. But usually it's still done um, kind of imitating the, the, the manual contact tracing that the information starts to propagate only after a positive test has been um, uh, uh, obtained. So, so this is where uh, machine learning can come in. Uh, because one of the challenges with um, just looking at symptoms is the you know there are many kinds of symptoms. You can have like easily a dozen symptoms that we currently know about that may be revealing of having um, uh, the COVID nineteen disease. And uh, yeah, how do you know? Uh, and and these symptoms can have different levels of severity. So so like how do you convert that information into um, a, an action probability, like what, what should you do? Should you warn your contacts? Uh, how, how much, uh, what should you tell them? Like how prudent should they become? Like maybe it's just a false alert. Like we don't want everyone to go into quarantine because they've been you know, in contact with somebody who's starting to have a cold, right? And so, so there's a trade-off here in general between um, uh, how much freedom we're gonna remove from people by asking them to be more prudent maybe to go into quarantine versus uh, how we can uh, slow down the rate of uh, propagation of the disease. And so it becomes really important to have the right tools to evaluate the trade-off. And that means we need to evaluate the risk, like the probability that you're contagious or the amount of contagiousness, like this viral load I was talking about. Uh, and you might use, if you consider one particular person, you can have many sources of information now to uh, provide clues that that person is contagious. So I already mentioned symptoms, uh, but we also know that um, a, uh, having the disease or not depends on prior medical conditions. So uh, one of the things uh, that we've done is build a questionnaire. Yeah, these, these questionnaires exist. Uh, they're becoming fairly standardized. Uh, we know a lot about medical conditions that increase your probability of getting the disease. Um, and we also know that things like age make a big difference. So you, you want to ask these kinds of questions ahead of time. And then when people start having symptoms, they could report them on their phone. Um, also, another source of information for a particular person is, um, have they been in contact with people who seem to be at risk? And what was the risk level of these people? Like how, how likely were they contagious and, and, uh, and so on? So now we have all of these sources of information, and you can see that it would be hard to come up with a handcrafted heuristic to combine all of those pieces of information. It makes much more sense to use machine learning to combine these pieces of information. And then, and then if we can do that, then we can provide an early warning signal, uh, well, first to the person, uh, but also to the people that the person has been in contact with, and potentially you know, their own contacts. So, so that's the idea of uh, machine learning-based uh, digital contact tracing. Okay, so, so let, me, let me go through a little um, uh, sketch scenario here to illustrate how the early awareness could save lives. So, so we're looking at this character. I'm sorry if the letters are too small for you to read, so I'm gonna explain verbally anyways. But we, we're looking at three potential uh, histories of uh, the same underlying scenario uh, where character Jim is going to uh, uh, get uh, infected and then potentially infecting others um, under a scenario where um, there's manual tracing going on, uh, a scenario where there is uh, digital tracing, and which we call binary tracing because you either 
you 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 have a binary decision that you know uh, you're at risk and so uh, you should change your behavior if you've been in contact with somebody who was contagious then suddenly you go in quarantine uh, versus a machine learning based approach the, the third row where you can have a graded signal that um, you know uh, because you're not completely sure that you're contagious uh, that you're infected and so instead of going you know uh, bang bang I, I, I behave as usual versus I go in quarantine, you can have intermediate levels of, um, of say, prudence that's going to change your behavior, but not necessarily prevent you from doing any activity. So, so at, at the top, what, what we see is that on, on the first week on the Wednesday, well, in, in all of the cases, uh, our character Jim has actually a contact with a high-risk stranger somewhere. Um, and what happens then is that the stranger, a couple of days later, starts showing symptoms. Now, in, in the manual and, and regular uh, digital tracing, that information uh, doesn't reach Jim. But, but actually, if, if Jim was using machine learning and the other person was using machine learning, uh, an app with these kinds of tools, uh, you could have early warning signals even uh, before the other person gets tested in, in the second week. So, so even before the other person gets uh, symptoms, because uh, that stranger has the app. Maybe her app has already calculated that because of the contacts um, that person had with others who were infected, that uh, she might already be at some level of risk. And then that level of risk will propagate to some extent to Jim. And so even on the first day, Jim might already get a, a signal that uh, he should be a little bit careful. And then when the stranger starts having symptoms, uh, Jim is going to get a slightly higher level recommendation of being careful. And then a few days later, um, um, when the stranger symptoms grow worse, then, the, then, then Jim gets an even stronger signal. And this is you know, where in, 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 the, in the cartoon story, uh, there's a difference because in one case, Jim decides to go to work and the other case, he decides not to go to work um, or to go to you know, whatever public place. Um, and um, and then we can see the difference between the manual tracing and digital tracing, uh, in the sense that the, the test result, uh, the time delay between the test result and Jim getting the information, uh, might you know uh, make also a big difference. So a few words quickly about some of the really interesting and, and uh, challenging issues uh, around these kinds of projects. First of all, um, it, it's it's a lot about privacy. So how do we how do we find the right trade-off between privacy considerations and machine learning considerations? Because uh, you know, at first sight, these two things are sort of in complete opposition. Uh, the privacy uh, considerations say, well, no data because any bit that I send is potentially exploited, and machine learning people want more data. You know, as much data as possible. Um, so it looks like uh, it's hard to resolve this. Um, but but really, you know, once you allow some data to to be exchanged, there are many options, um, and you'd like to find sort of the privacy and the security and the communication options that are, that are going to be good from a privacy perspective, but also allow enough information to um, to be uh, propagated for machine learning to do its job. Um, and when you look at the privacy issues, there's basically two big categories that you have to think of. There is the big brother attacks and the little brother attacks. So what is that? So big brother attacks, I think we understand that um, we don't want, say, governments or large companies to uh, centralize data about everyone so that they can use it for purposes that are not good for us, in particular threaten our democratic rights or exploit us in any way. Um, the little brother attacks are a bit more, uh, I mean, uh, people think more or less about these things. Um, so what it means is your neighbor getting to know that you're infected or the people uh, that you meet on the street to know that you're infected. So of course you don't want that, right? You don't want that because you, you, you want to protect your dignity. Uh, you don't want to be uh, discriminated against. You don't want to be stigmatized. So, uh, or even taken advantage of by somebody who could, you know, knowing that you're infected, you know, make money out of you or something. So uh, unfortunately, the different kinds of solutions uh, that exist in terms of privacy tend to be either 
um, like mostly helping against the big brother problem or mostly helping against the little brother about the problem, it is hard to reconcile both kinds of uh, defenses. But you have to keep that in mind and you have to make some choices which may depend on wh what do people care most about. Um, okay. Um, now, from a machine learning perspective, um, I won't have time to go in a lot of detail, but there are many approaches that one could look at. Um, uh, unfortunately, often uh, the approaches we can think of come in contradiction with the privacy constraints. So, for example, it's not easy to do things like the first thing that came to me when I, I looked at the problem was, oh, we're just going to do loopy belief propagation or something like this, where the nodes correspond to different people and their phones. Unfortunately, this requires communicating a lot of information very often between all the phones. Um, and um, uh, if you want to do uh, learning uh, on a server, that means the server would have access to the full what's called contact graph, like who met whom, when, and where. And this is something like uh, is really, really bad from the point of view of a big brother attack. Um, and so ideally, we don't want to have any such file that contains the contact graph of every, everyone. So you need to find solutions that, that avoid that. Um, I see that time is flying. So uh, let me skip a few things. Let me tell you about what we have um, been exploring. Um, so we've explored a solution in which um, the phone is doing a lot of the calculations, but we're also using a central server to do the learning. Uh, ideally, we would use federated learning, but that raises other challenges. And from a machine learning point of view, what's uh, sort of a bit challenging is that the input now is not a fixed size thing. It depends on the contacts that I've had in the last two weeks, and the number of these contacts varies. So we wanted to use a machine learning method that can deal with variable length input, and, and one such approach is transformers, which is what you, we've been using. Um, also, another kind of tricky question is, well, what do we want to predict exactly? And in, in, I, I mean, ideally, what we want to predict is something which, unfortunately, we can't measure, which is the contagiousness I had uh, n days ago. So let's say Alice met Bob five days ago, and now Alice has some probability of, of uh, being infected. Um, what kind of information should Alice send Bob so that Bob um, you know, uh, optimally changes his behavior? And um, what makes a lot of sense from an epidemiological perspective is, well, basically, Bob wants to know if he's infected. And the, the information that's most relevant to that is um, how contagious was Alice five days ago when she met Bob. And so the, the predictor on Alice's phone should be predicting for each day of the past two weeks um, how contagious she was um, so that she can send that information to her contacts of those days. Uh, so now it means the output is also uh, not just a single scalar, but, a, but a, a, you know, one, at least one quantity for each day in the past. Um, let me skip that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so one issue uh, is the thing that we want to predict isn't something we can actually measure. Like contagious is not something you're going to get from the tests, especially contagiousness in the past. So what we want to do is infer it. And the approach we've chosen is to infer it using a, uh, a generative model of the joint distribution between the things you observe, like especially on, on your phone, and the things you don't observe, which are latent variables, and, um, and training an epidemiological model which captures that joint distribution on one hand, and the other hand, training a, a neural net inference machine that predicts the latent variables given the observed variables. So this is something that should sound familiar. You know, it's basically what EM does, right? So uh, we've explored approaches based on amortized versional inference, which is what you have in VAEs, um, but essentially similar to what you do in EM. Uh, I'm going to skip that. And just uh, last bit is that uh, part of that research project involves building a good um, simulator, a good generative model for the, all of these variables. And the best way to do that is to have a really good epidemiological model that is organized at the level of individuals. So it's not just like the standard ones that are compartment-based models, 
where um, you simulate the proportion of the population which is in different stages. Instead here, you do this, but for each person in the population, uh, which raises all kinds of computational challenges. Uh, it needs a lot of computational power, um, but it's uh, in this way, you're able to simulate things like, what if this particular person, given the information that she has on her phone, change her behavior in such and such way? How would that affect the overall evolution of the virus? So this is the kind of calculation we've been doing. Um, this is more information about the simulator. Um, and, uh, and, and our simulations seem to suggest that indeed this uh, early warning signals allow you to reduce the number of infections, to reduce what's called the um, uh, reproduction number of the virus, which is uh, how many people a person will infect in average. So this is a second graph in, 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 uh, in, in, in there in the bottom. Uh, where we see that the machine learning based method is able to reduce by maybe 30% the uh, this reproduction number. And that translates into number of cases, uh, which is not going to grow as quickly um, compared to other uh, approaches like standard contact tracing. So I'm going to stop here and just mention that this is the work of a lot of people again. And thank you very much.